can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walk through the fire, came out better on the other side. See lights like a beach if you find the same right now. I'm feeling like a hundred grand. You are listening to Inspired Insider with your host, Dr. Jeremy Wise. Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders. Today is no different. I have Dustin Titus. You can check them out at Titus. One. And Dustin, before I formally introduce you, and Dustin's been doing this for over 17 years. I think I don't want to age you or anything, Dustin. But uh, so I'm excited to hear your journey and experience. Um, before I'm going to mention a couple other episodes people should check out before I introduce Dustin and his company, but. Um, since this is part of the top agency series, Dustin, here's a couple interesting ones. Um, I had Kevin Hurrigan of Spinatech. He's had an agency since 1995. It was interesting to hear not just the landscape of agency world, but also the landscape of the internet and also the business world and the ups and downs he had throughout the journey. So that was an interesting episode. Um, another one was with a D. Clevet. A D. Clevet uh, has an interesting niche. Um, we'll talk about your niche, Dessa, but like uh, she does SOPs. So she comes in and is an easy button for a company to do SOPs. So like if they want to smooth out the client onboarding, the staff onboarding or any operational pieces, they call her. And that was a good episode because we kind of geek out on productivity tools, operations, all the, you know, the non-sexy stuff that makes things work. So that was a really good episode as well. Um, and this episode is brought to you by Rise25. Uh, at Rise25, we help businesses give to and connect to their dream relationships and partnerships. And how do we do that? We actually do that by helping you run your podcast. We're an easy button for a company to launch and run a podcast. We do one of the most important things, if not the most important things, the strategy, the accountability, and the full execution. So we kind of doesn't call ourselves the magic elves that run in the background and make it look easy for the host and the company so they can develop amazing relationships, create amazing content, and most importantly, run their business. You know, the number one thing in my life is relationships. I'm always looking at ways to give to my best relationships. And I found no better way over the past decade to profile the people and companies I most admire and share with the world what they're working on. So if you've thought about podcasting, you should. If you have questions, go to rise25.com or email us at support at rise25.com. Um, I love also just introducing my guests to each other. It's one of my favorite things to do. Um, so I am excited to choose Dustin Titus. He's the Chief Digital Officer at Zoomer Media, uh, but he is agency president at Titus. That one will explain what that means um, and the journey there. But they power advertisers and publishers scaling to make the biggest impact on the world. And they do that by connecting them to the right people, ideas, and addressable audiences. And Titus One have helped a lot of clients. You know, I just mentioned you know monetizing publishing networks to um, vodka or alcohol brands to cannabis brands to uh, lots of other types of um, brands and niches. So Dustin, thanks for joining me. Yeah, thanks for having me. Just start off for a second and talk about Titus One and what you do. And um, there is a video component to this. So if you are listening to the audio, I'm going to pull up their site and we're going to take a look. Yeah, awesome. Thanks. So yeah, Titus One's a digital marketing agency. Um, you know, originally actually started uh, in the CPG space. Um, you know, we were working with uh, a number of different confectionery and chocolate companies, uh, and that sort of grew from there into alcohol, beverage, and then marine recreation, and and then facilitating or helping to facilitate publishing relationships as well. Um, you know, as we spend more money on advertising and working with Pub Direct, we thought, hey, it'd be cool to to help pubs. You know, help help advertisers as well. So uh, we, it's a well-rounded a agency focused, focused on, on full service. Um, but, but our, our version of full service, um, you know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, relationships are important to you. Uh, they're also very important to us. Um, but the way that we execute our relationships is probably the most important part for us. Uh, and so, you know, working with, uh, you know, in, in multiple integrated agency teams over the years, uh, what we really felt was missing in, in the agency space was uh, a very customer service focused agency that 
that really did actually deliver um, white white glove experiences. Um, so Titus One is is definitely built on a couple of different principles. Um, our core values, uh, which are uh, freedom, flexibility, uh, hard work, dedication, um, and then you know focusing on on working with clients that are aligned to those those values, and then you know building team members that are also there too. So the, talk about the niche, how you eventually made it to monetizing publishing networks, because it sounds like you started off with CPG, yeah. talk about the evolution of the niche, the niches sure. that you've gone through. Yeah, sure. So my background is computer science. Um, and, uh, you know, oddly enough, where we really started, uh, you know, uh, 17 years ago is helping CPG take advantage of news feed algorithms uh, through content programming. Uh, and uh, as that sort of evolved more and more, uh, more and more clients started asking for more technical based services. So what uh, does yeah. that look like? Yeah. So if you're, if you're building content programs uh, and somebody needs to, you know, wants to start a, an email, an email platform and integrate it with their website and so on, you know, we really started to help out with the technical aspect of their, of their systems. So, you know, today we, we probably do just as much technical work as we do sort of like brand and creative strategy um, because we can kind of, dig really deep into technical strategy and, and move that across your, your CDP platform and, you know, into your monetization systems as well. So as we, we do more work um, it, it, there, what we found was we were working with, um, we'd be working with or buying uh, advertiser direct um, or sorry, publisher direct um, media. And uh, we were getting terrible results from some of the pubs we were working with. And so then you start digging into why you're getting those results, you know, and, um, and most brands have one of two problems, right? They have a they have a funnel problem or they have a traffic problem. And, uh, you know, if you're confident that your funnel is running well, um, then, you know, you've got to take a look at your traffic. And so working with a number of different Canadian publishers, um, you know, we felt we could we could really help them do a good job of 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 working with their um, with their traffic and their audiences and, and helping support advertisers. So that's when we started taking on, you know, taking on uh, publisher stuff. Give me an example of what that looks like. So first mm -hmm. it was like, I don't know, whatever it's a cannabis brand or vodka brand or like, what does yeah. that look like totally. with when you were working with them and yeah. where they're being placed, et cetera? So, you know, the, I, I think the most important part to understand really is like legalization in Canada uh, from a cannabis perspective happened, I think, 2017, 2018, if I can remember. Um, and, uh, you know, there was a, a significant age gating component that needed to be in place in order for um, cannabis brands to advertise with publishers. Uh, and so as we were kind of approaching different pubs that we were interested in working with um, or placing advertising with, we noticed that they didn't have... Um, they didn't have uh, first party data uh, that we we could absolutely identify, have birth dates on and, and so on. And so we needed to start putting in platform, start putting in programs with them so that we could get the kind of data and age gated sort of experience that we needed in order to serve our cannabis ads. So for the most part, you know, that was sort of the foray into working closely with publishers was helping to in them to integrate the technology they needed to help service the cannabis advertising that we wanted to place. So talk about then from the publishing network side and what you do with them. Yeah. So um, with publishers at the moment, we're, we're focused primarily on, uh, on SSP integration um, with both open, open bidding uh, and header bidding uh, type environments. Um, and then, you know, working through DSP and then into identity, identity, uh, identity graphs, or in, in some cases, content graphs. Um, but we're working on uh, taking a look at what advertising products they have on, on, uh, online, uh, what we can optimize more of what's not working, what is working, uh, how we integrate higher impact. I mean, everyone's asking for higher impact ad placements. I think we're, we're done with, you know, done with MPUs and, and sort of like lower impact stuff. Um, and so, you know, one, one thing about, about the publishing space is that I, you know, they're really, behind on um on high impact ad placements um i mean some of them are doing a better job than others for sure um but you know when you're up against some of the larger let's call them like programmatic resellers um you know who have beautiful creative experiences but might not be able to have the kind of control they want over those creative um experiences you know working pub direct you know we can we can increase that that high impact availability with 
better, bigger, more interactive ad units. Um, and we can do that without having to having to go through the traditional means, which is like a big box and then expanding that big box into a more, more you know, ele elegant experience. We can actually just start with an, and launch with that elegant experience. So what does high impact look like? Like, give me an example of of that within uh, a publishing network. Yeah. So Maybe I mean, if there's a specific ad so I can kind of visualize yeah. it. Sure. So a lot of people like look at high impact. Uh, I mean, in the traditional sense, you know, uh, billboards, half pages, uh, you know, 970 by 250s, 300 by 600s, um, you know, uh, inter scrollers. We're looking at uh, maybe there's a back. site we can pull up. What, you know, I know you mentioned yeah, before yeah. we hit record. Yeah. I don't know if Daily Hive or The Peak or one of those, and we can take a look and see. Yeah. You know, I would take a look at, if you want to see like some really great high impact stuff, take a look at fiercepharma.com. Um, Fierce is doing a really great job of of Fierce of higher impact ad units um and you'll see those sort of pop it's up just fiercepharma.com yeah yeah you got it okay um cool. so yeah the, i mean these are all really great experiences that we're we're working on on providing and working with advertisers you know as an agency to help take advantage of these and then working with publishers to help implement them as well all right so let's take a look here so here we go yeah so Fierce this one Pharma. You've got a you've got a big one up up top, um, and then as we sort of scroll down through the site, um, you'll you'll see some uh, in stream, uh, out stream video placements, um, and you'll see some sticky ad units on the side. I think that big box at some point will stick as well, um, but we'll we'll kind of see these ad experience kind of get a little bit better uh, mm -hmm. as we scroll through the page. Um, you might need to go to an article to see sort of like the, the true experience. So maybe click on click on a link here. Any of these like this yeah. one? Admit? Yeah, okay. totally. Yeah, cool. Uh, yeah, yeah. So here, you know, here's a here's a half page shows up on the right hand side for Google Workspace, uh, and then you see so just as you scroll through the uh, the article, you'll see different ad placements sort of pop up. Um, so yeah, our goal is to to help publishers continue to 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 deliver what advertisers are looking for, and so having experiences on both sides of the fence, we can we can work closer with that publishers to help them get the advertisers what they're looking for. Got it. So these this type of you know publishing networks, you'll help them further kind of monetize the yeah. the content and the site and the traffic with various placements placements, whether it's on the yeah. homepage or different articles and and yeah. everything like that. Yeah, and 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 now we're getting into you know more of the audience side of things, right? Because you know the the, the content monetization is cool, and the placements are great, and the different types of experiences we can deliver are are pretty neat too. Um, but now you know again, you know we, we sort of spoke about it earlier, but the you know the the third party deprecation stuff that's happening, uh, you know, from Google Chrome perspective, anyways, over the next you know sort of six to twelve months is is really going to impact. Uh, the type of addressability that we we have and um, how we can access those audience. So so audiences are the, are sort of the next step of monetization with publishers. And also, we could see um, long table here. It's funny because I just had someone on oh, yeah. the podcast who helps with their fulfillment. Cool. Um, so uh, here they are, long nice. table, right there, which are, I think, pancakes or waffles mix. So that's cool. awesome. Um, yeah. I want to talk about, it's an interesting journey with Zoomer Media and, and Titus One yeah. from <laughs> client to acquisition, actually. Yeah. Um, can you talk about when does Zoomer Media first enter the picture for you? Yeah, sure. So uh, Zoomer entered the picture in 2017. Uh, our agency was focused on helping them uh, with uh, newsletter subscriptions and membership subscriptions, uh, and running a lot of sort of traditional sort of like ad adwords, um, Google search, Google display, uh, programmatic retargeting, and you know meta ads and so on. And our goal was to help increase the size of their first party audience database uh, and both you know membership uh, memberships for their magazine and for their uh, not for profit that they work with as well, Carp. Did the evolution of what you did with them, did that change or was it the same from the beginning throughout? Yeah. So, you know, as, as we continued to work with them, um, you know, consumer really enjoyed our client experience. Uh, again, super high touch. 
Um, uh, it's an agile for marketing sort of experience. So we're, you know, we're meeting with people weekly, uh, both internal and external. Uh, we're doing monthly performance reviews. We're doing quarterly strategy reviews. We're doing annual planning. Uh, we're sending out, uh, you know, weekly emails on Monday mornings to kind of let you know what we did last week, what we're doing this week, where we're blocked from you. Uh, and our goal is to really be as, as high touch as possible. And so as we uh, continued our relationship with Zoomer and as that grew sort of into, you know, into the pandemic, we took on a, a lot of marketing for their TV divisions, their radio divisions as well. Uh, and uh, and sort of, you know, we're here to support them as they um, it started to integrate uh, newer brands to help their uh, Gen Z millennial reach like Blog TO and Daily Hive. At what point in the conversation do you start discussing acquisition? Yeah. Uh, so um, the their CEO and I, Omri, uh, you know, have been working closely together since since seventeen, and um, you know, as our engagement continued to grow, um, you know, we we sort of discussed the idea that maybe maybe they could use my help internally, uh, and so bringing in an internal agency to help. Uh, to help support their clients and, and and their products was was something that sort of started to make sense. So um, yeah, it was really like a, a growth thing. So as the relationship grew, we got to a point where it's like, hey, listen, does it make more sense for us to bring you internally than continue to support you as an external vendor? What would you, looking back, because uh, this happened, I mean, right now in time, mm. several months back, that you would tell another founder on some lessons learned in navigating that conversation and acquisition? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think, I think using the full breadth of your network uh, as you have conversations around acquisition and what the deal looks like and the deal structure looks like, really leaning on every single person you have in that network to, to help look at your, you look at what you're doing and how you're doing it. And I think, I think using your community is the most important part. Um, you know, and 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 leaning on your your legal and, and accounting teams as much as possible. Uh, you know, uh, through through the the through the acquisition is the most important thing you can do. They're really what that runs the whole the whole program. So, how long did it take from first conversation to finalizing the acquisition? Yeah, we so uh, probably January to, to September. It was relatively quickly. Um, you know, some of these acts take uh, acquisitions take you know a year or two. Um, we did it within nine months. Um, so yeah, relatively fast. Were well, there certain things that I've had people on in the past talk about acquisition, and there's certain things that they had um, kind of deal breakers mm. that they like. Okay, whatever, whatever that is. Maybe it was. You know, one person I remember said, I don't want to travel. Yeah. You know, because they had a young family or other, you know, the various things. Were there anything yeah. for that for you that you're like, everything's good, but I just want to make sure this this piece for me is is met. Yeah. I mean, uh autonomy, um, you know, transcendence. Those were like, those were things for me that like really needed to be met in order for me to feel comfortable with sort of leaving the shore behind, if you will, as far as you know, running my own shop. Um, and I mean, you've done that for over 17 years. So it's a yes, big change, huge change. But if you've got the autonomy you need to continue doing what you need to do um, or know what you need to do, uh, it feels a little bit easier, you know? Um, and so, you know, Zoomer has been a great, great partner and, and been able to deliver a significant amount of autonomy in my role uh, and uh, as an agency. And, um, you know, it's been a smooth transition so far. But, um, you know, it, it's always like to me, I always look at, and this is sort of like, the, the agile manifesto anyways, but like, you know, really great teams need three things to be successful, right? That's transcendence, autonomy, and process, process, process. Uh, and so for me, it was like, if I have uh, a new role with um, some some autonomy within that organization, and I can continue, continue to build and grow my systems as I need to, to be successful, then I'm comfortable with, the, with what's going to happen longer term. So do you function, does Titus One kind of function as a separate entity under yeah. Zoomer? Yeah, we're 100 percent a separate entity, and we continue to we continue to operate uh, independently. Um, and uh, my time split, you know, half half between uh, between the, my CDO responsibilities and uh, and then on on top of the uh, the agency roles too. Yeah, I was gonna ask how did how has your role changed yeah. after acquisition? <laughs> 
I mean, I'm uh, my schedule is pretty packed. Uh, I'm not gonna lie. I'm a frontline a frontline leader, so it involves a lot of conversations and and building and growing teams. So um, I would say, if if anything, my schedule is a little bit bigger than it was. Um, and I'm you know I'm working I'm working across time zones with you know daily hives in Vancouver. So um, we're doing a lot of work you know into into the early evenings, and so yeah, it's a it's a packed schedule for sure. I'm curious, um, and you don't have to tell me numbers, but from structuring yeah. the deal, yeah. how was the valuation figured out? Was it based off of EBITDA? How how did they come, or when you had a company, figure out the valuation? Yeah, it was 100% based on EBITDA. Um, you know, and and then we looked at, uh, then we looked at sort of like the forecast from a client perspective, uh, where we think we're going to be in three, five years, uh, where we think we would be with or without uh, sales support, um, you know, where we think we can take take this thing. Uh, we talked a lot a lot about that. And then we also talked about, you know, the impact that I could have on on the parent company as well. And, and what what that would what that would sort of like grow and generate as well. So it was a little bit of a, an aqua hire more than anything else. But, um, you know, we, we were able to take a look at at like sort of future impact and where we think we can go from a growth perspective. And typically, I found there's there's some combination of obviously cash and equity. Mm -hmm. Is that similar? In this yeah, case? it was it was a hundred percent cash deal. Um, so yeah, we we went we went that route instead. And hundred percent cash. Yeah. Oh. Uh, and and structured in an earnout. Um, and uh, yeah, in a new role. So very exciting. Hmm. Congratulations, that's awesome. Thank what you. is the team? look like at Titus one? Yeah. So we really split our team uh, amongst uh, strategy, creative technology, media and marketing. Um, and we have a number of different sort of senior resources leading, leading each of those teams. Um, I think that uh, as a, as a smaller agency and one that sort of grew up over the last 10 years, um, we really focused on, on people first. And so we did a lot of engagements with our people, rather they wanted to be, you know, in a full-time employee, a part-time employee, a freelancer, a contractor. Uh, we really gave our people the opportunity to work with us however they wanted to work with us. Um, we've been virtual since day one, by the way. So um, when, when the pandemic sort of hit, uh, it was sort of business as usual. We've built all of our process and systems in a virtual environment. Um, and so, you know, we're a relatively farther ahead, I think, than a lot of folks um, who are still trying to sort through, you know, what's your return to work policy and how is everyone going to show up at the office? And it was like, it was never really a thing for us. Um, you know, we were really all about empowering our people uh, to live their best lives. And so, um, you know, that laptop lifestyle was, was part of the Titus One culture for a long time. Um, you know, it, 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 started as a project for me to go skiing more. So um, as I skied more, so business sort of grew and, and you know, and, and here we are. So I really wanted to make sure we were able to support people that work with us in that same, in that same capacity as well. So why did you start the agency way back when? What got well, you? Because I could see you yeah. developing, yeah. obviously your backgrounds in computer science. Totally. Yeah, my background is computer science. Um, so after school, I, I just I wanted to go skiing for a while. So I, you know, I, I taught skiing professionally at a few a few ski resorts in uh, in British Columbia, um, and I uh, really enjoyed enjoyed that lifestyle. And and so we were actually uh, I, I had a a, a partner uh, early days, um, and we were watching what was going on in Silicon in, in sort of like in Silicon Valley. It was happening in San Francisco, and we decided to to head down there on a regular basis. So we were doing like this is we're talking like oh five oh six right. So we were down at CES and we were down at like Google I/O when you could just walk in off the street with Google I/O and fifty bucks on a on a student uh, student to sort of like. Uh, ID card and they give you a bunch of handsets and you know you sat through really cool uh, programming experiences all day. Um, but you know before it was sold out online in 15 seconds, sort of sort of deals. Um, and so we were doing a lot of a lot of that kind of stuff and really hanging out and watching what was going on and and where we could be most uh, successful and effective. And one of my first clients was a uh, was on a Canadian Alpine ski team. And uh, I helped him sort of build a Facebook page for the first time. And, and we started really looking at like how algorithms worked and what they were doing and, and how they were functioning. And at the same time, I was doing a lot of like, uh, I was actually working as a, as a network administrator. So administering uh, BlackBerry enterprise servers, uh, uh, Exchange servers, yeah, Windows servers, Unix stuff, like doing a lot more sort of that kind of stuff at night. And, um, you know, it sort of started to pair this world of like system administration with 
with sort of like front forward facing marketing and what that looked like. So um, yeah, it kind of snowballed from there. Uh, and uh, we started doing a lot more, a lot more uh, marketing work and then a lot more technology work at the same time. What was the first milestone client for you? Obviously you had the first client, but what about after that? Yeah. I mean, um, there was a, there was a, a, a consumer packaged good brand called uh, the Allen Candy Company. Uh, and uh, Allen Candy uh, produced uh, a number of different confectionery and chocolate brands here in Canada. Um, and, and Candy Canes was on their portfolio as well. So uh, we took on uh, Bigfoot Candy, which was a small little red Swedish berry tasting foot. Uh, and we grew communities there for them in both confectionery and chocolate portfolios. Really interesting. Um, I'm curious... You know, Dustin, you know, um, a really good one of my favorite podcasts, uh, Built to Sell, John Warlow. Yeah. Um, and he talks about, you know, he wrote the book Built to Sell, and he talks a lot about informing teams mm -hmm. um, or leaders in this acquisition process. I'm curious how yeah. you navigated that. Yeah. I mean, I maybe it didn't matter as much because you kind of were still a separate entity, but how did you navigate communicating with the team during the, these discussions? Uh, yeah, with my with my my team, um, you know, making them part of the process was was probably the most important part of this. Um, and making them part of the process uh, the entire time, not just as part of the acquisition, was really number one for me. Um, you know, I think co-creation and the idea of co-creation from a social design perspective is is one of the most important things we can do as leaders with our team members. Uh, and if we're co-creating, um, you know, using a, an inside out hierarchy rather than a top down hierarchy, as far as our organizational structures are concerned, um, we'll get a lot of buy in and we'll be able to really help and support those those people that work with us. Um, you know, I'm, I'm not a leader who dictates. I'm a leader who is there to support my team in whatever they want to do. Uh, and so when it was time for them to help support me, uh, you know, we work together on on working through the, the process and system together. Did you ha go in? Did you have any concerns when you were first going to tell them? That... <laughs> I mean, I cried through the entire meeting, um, <laughs> you know, which like had never happened before. Um, but yeah, I mean, you know, there are always there are always these concerns, I think, of, no, matter, no matter what you're introducing or announcing of how it's going to be be taken but my goal was to have as many individual conversations as possible with leaders and and even those on the front lines to sort of let them know sort of the direction that we're going to take the business and and, and how and, and how and what kind of opportunity i see for them moving forward and i think that's really important here so the way you navigate it was maybe you kind of talk to each person individually before bringing them all together yeah totally um you know first of all dustin thank you for sharing the yeah. journey, the lessons. I have one last question uh, before I ask it. I want to encourage people. They can check out Titus. That one, um, and they can also check out ZoomerMedia.ca to learn more about Zoomer uh, as well. Um, just, I'd love to hear some of your favorite resources. Uh, mm -hmm. Resources could be some of your favorite books. Yeah. They could be some of your favorite software or tech stack. What yeah. are some of your favorite resources? Sure. I mean, this is a huge question. I, I did a lot of my leadership uh, work uh, through reading. Uh, reading, I would say, was the number one way for me to kind of get new ideas and information. And so uh, I've got a long book list. In fact, I've got a book list that everyone, that I, I like everyone in my, my team to read too, so they understand. Lay it on me sort of the guiding the guiding principles. Um, you know, agile for marketing is, is really an important process. And, you know, being a software developer, uh, I was really able to um, take advantage of an agile approach. So, you know, I would say agile is, is definitely from a project and customer management perspective, something that I would definitely take a look at. Um, there's a book that I read early days on that one, which was uh, The Art of Doing Twice the Work in Half the Time. One um, of my favorites. Yeah, yeah, Jeff Sutherland and JJ Sutherland. Yeah, you, you got it. So that was like, that was number one for me as far as like understanding how to engage and work with teams. That was such a good book. Yeah. Um, I also had uh, some early mentors um, that really focused on the scaling up methodology, um, which uh, Vern Harnish uh, and sort of like a strategic coach thing. Um, and so, uh, that was, that was really important for us as well as we worked around, um, some stuff I really like lately, um, the 
15 commitments of conscious leadership. Um, I love the concept of operating below and above the line. Uh, I think that's you know just so ridiculously relevant in, in today's sort of socio socioeconomic sphere. Um, the intergalactic design guide, harnessing the potential of social design. Uh, that thing is fantastic. You know, hmm. um, social design for me, and as far as how our teams organize and operate and work together, um, is super important. And uh, this book outlines, you know, old ways of doing things versus new ways of doing things. And uh, that that for me was 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 top of it for sure. So yeah, um, I'm have we, to look. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, from a tech from a tech. Stack perspective, um, you know, we're using uh, Jura as the foundation of everything we do. Uh, we love time tracking so we can kind of measure and give our leadership as much visibility as possible. So we layer in a, a tool in Jura called Tempo. Um, we use the Google Workspace uh, platform as well, and we integrate Slack in there too. So yeah, it's a pretty, I mean, it's a pretty standard stack, but um, what what really gets us going though are our daily standups. Our teams meet every day at 10 a.m. Um, we meet on client projects uh, once a week. Uh, we meet, we try with some of our larger clients, we meet with them once a week, if not bi-weekly. Um, you know, we send out Monday morning emails to sort of get in front of our, our, our clients uh, on Monday morning to remind them sort of what's going on and how it's going. Uh, and I mentioned that sort of that, that monthly performance and quarterly strategy review. I mean, I think that's really important from a, a customer service perspective. So how do you run the daily standups? What'd you do yesterday? What are you doing today? And where are you blocked? Uh, you know, so uh, quick, quick and easy. I mean, lately I've been really just focused on like where are we having problems and challenges? And you know, I'm 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 happy to celebrate the wins, but I'm I'm really interested to know and help unblock team members uh, as much as possible. And so you know, um, those those daily standups for me are really like identifying those pain points and those pinch points in 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 regular sort of project flows, and and then understanding how I can unblock them. No, I really appreciate it, Dustin. I uh, will have to check out the 15 commandments of conscious leadership and the intergalactic design one. Yeah. Um, Scrum and scaling up. People can check out. Uh, I did an interview with Vern Harnish. That was a really good one. Who's the author of, of scaling up. So that was a good one. It's also a great book. But um, thanks for sharing this. Dustin, this is fantastic. Everyone check out um, Titus.1. And check out zoomermedia.ca. More episodes of the podcast. And uh, we'll see everyone next time. Thanks, Dustin. Thanks. What I got, you can't buy. It resides between my eyes. Walked through the fire, came out better on the other side. See, life's like a beach if you find the sand. And right now, I'm feeling like a hundred grand.